Welcome for those of you logging on. David should join us any minute. It would be wonderful if someone could um, maybe give a thumbs up if there's um, if you're coming through clearly on the audio. And then when David comes on, we will. Uh, I forgive the background noise. Here we go. Yo, can you hear me? Yeah, there you are. David. Hey. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How you doing, Andrew? Great. Great to see you. It's been a little while, but um, yes. wonderful that we could connect here. Yes, good. Thanks for this. All right. I think they're barking next door. So in the true spirit of live, I'm going to close the door. Okay. Great. Well, David... Thanks so much for joining. Um, I know that a very large number of people are excited to hear us chat neuroplasticity. Um, folks, for those of you that are logging on now, if there's a slight delay, um, that could be on your end. If, if for some reason either of us cut out, we'll just uh, restart. Um, and yes, this will be recorded uh, starting at the point in which we, we gain fluidity here. Um, well, it's a pleasure to welcome you here, David. David is probably the one neuroscientist that truly needs no introduction um, because uh, so many people know who you are already. But uh, Dave is a colleague at Stanford, um, a colleague of the entire neuroscience community. He's also the person that I credit, of course, with, uh, and I think everybody credits with being the foremost modern educator on brain science. He was um, first person in and first person out in the, in the real world talking about brain science in a way that scientists respect and appreciate and also making it interesting to the general public. So um, that's, a, you know, just a partial introduction. He's uh, well known in our community and, and the world, uh, of course. And, and now you have this other role at your company where you're building devices for cross modal plasticity. Do you just want to mention the company and what it is so that people are yeah. familiar with that? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I spun a company out of my lab a few years ago called NeoSensory, and it's all about building new senses. And so what we've done is built a wristband with vibratory motors in it, and uh, our, main, our main market for this is for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. We capture sound, turn it into vibrations on the skin, and through the pattern of vibration on the skin, people without hearing can come to understand the world because it doesn't matter how the information gets to the brain, whether it goes through this very sophisticated system here that breaks into frequencies and ships to the brain or goes through this system that ships it off to the brain. The brain figures out how to make the correlations and understand what's going on. So this is called Buzz, the neocentric Buzz, and it's now on wrists all over the world. Amazing. Um, so. I know there are a lot of questions that are going to come in, but I have a few about neuroplasticity. I did read your book. It's amazing. Great. And for folks listening, this, that's not a book plug of the, that comes easily for me. You know, I came up under the, uh, you know, Hubel and Weasel, who are some of the you know, first people. They want to know about prize, in fact, for their work on neuroplasticity and vision. And um, they are discussed there. Their discoveries are there. What's, what's really cool, I, I think, about the book is, you discuss things that mostly only neuroscientists have known about up until now, like Pons geniculate occipital waves and these amazing cases. I don't want to give it away, but that I'd never heard of, of people who are lacking or who have specialized sensory apparatus, nose, ears, mouth, these kinds of things. Um, some really incredible stuff. If we were to just kind of zoom out and look at, you know, the neuroplasticity as it stands in 2020, I always think, okay, there's behavioral stuff that people are doing. They're trying to learn by bringing more focus. There's stuff like supplements, drugs, there's machines and devices. What are you most excited about in terms of where we are now and where things are headed with neuroplasticity? And I know the book gets into a lot of this, um, but if you were to just say like, what's the thing that gets you most fired up about where things are going in terms of modifying the brain and nervous system? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, um, I could sooner pick my favorite star from the sky because there are many things I'm interested in, but that's, yeah, I'll tell you about it. 
By the way, I've seen some of the messages coming through that people are asking, what is the book? It's called Live Wired, the uh, inside story of the ever-changing brain. And uh, actually, give me one, uh, one second tangent about why I chose that title. It's because <clears throat> the argot of the field, the term that we use is plasticity. And that's a perfectly good term, but it was coined 100 years ago where the idea was, you know, if you mold something into shape and it holds on to that shape, we call that plastic. And that's why we build, you know, toys and uh, apparatuses and stuff out of plastic because it holds on to that shape. But what I suggest is that might not be um, a strong enough word to describe what we're really figuring out that's going on in here because your brain is constantly reconfiguring. So as you know, people, some people may know, you know, you have 86 billion brain cells, neurons, and each of those have about 10,000 connections with others. So you've got hundreds of trillions of connections and your whole life, these are constantly unplugging and replugging and changing and seeking and finding new places. And so what this means is, um, you know, it's like a dynamic electric living fabric that's going on under the hood here. That's of a magnitude that bankrupts our language. We don't have any way to even understand or think about things this, uh, of this magnitude. But anyway, that's what the book's about. And that's why I use the term live wired instead of plastic, because I think it's, uh, it captures the spirit more of what's going on. And of course, you know, Andrew and I, we live in Silicon Valley, where all the talk is on hardware and software, but, but what's happening here is a completely different kind of thing. It's, it's, um, you know, it's liveware, where the system is reconfiguring its own circuitry on the fly. So, Andrew, in answer to the, uh, what I think is most exciting, um, <clears throat> a few things. One of them is the fact that the brain can figure out how to drive the body irrespective of the body it's in. So I give an example in the book, as you know, about uh, this dog that was born without front legs, this dog named Faith, um, and she just figures out how to walk bipedally on her back legs, just like, a, just like a human does. And it's not that hard for her. She needed to get to food and water and her mother and so on, so she figured out how to do it. The interesting part is what this tells us is that the dog brain is not pre-programmed to drive a dog body. It can figure out, oh, okay, I've got a slightly different body. Or, or when a wolf gets its leg caught in a trap, it chews off its leg, and then it figures out how to walk on three legs. No problem. And so um, I think that this opens up this whole world, which is, as, as you know, has already been going on for a few years now, where people are really thinking about how can we have people who are paralyzed control robotic limbs um, just, you know, by thinking about moving their own arm and moving it. But you can also have them control extra limbs that aren't part of their body. You know, this has been done in animals now where they control another limb. And, and in, in virtual reality, our colleague Jeremy Balenson does this in VR, where you play a game where you're controlling a third arm coming out of your chest. So you're using your manipulators to control your real arm and also using them to control this third arm, and it just doesn't take very long to figure out how to do it. So that's number one, is we can control other kinds of bodies. Number two is we can take in different kinds of senses. So I mentioned that with neosensory technology, what we're doing is helping people who are deaf or hard of hearing, but we can actually feed any kind of data stream in here. And if anyone's interested in this, um, uh, I gave a TED talk on this a few years ago called Can We Create New Senses for Humans? And what we can do is, you know, we've, for just as an example, we've fed in uh, infrared light. So, you know, I can feel where infrared light is and walk around and incorporate that into part of my perception of the world. Or um, we can feed in stock market data or Twitter data or balance data or a uh, hundred other things that we're doing right now. We have a number of projects going on. We're feeding in different data streams. And as long as that gets to the brain, uh, the brain figures out how to make the correlations. It figures out how its own output correlates to what the input becomes. And so um, this, is the, this is the other thing I'm really excited about, is that we can change the outputs, we can change the inputs, because it's not the case that the brain is sort of dropping into the world genetically pre-programmed just to operate this. It can operate anything that, uh, where it's getting the data from or can send the data to. Amazing. Yeah, I, um, this has been a particularly exciting couple of weeks because with LiveWired coming out and then Neuralink doing their presentations and I'm um, actually a former 
postdoc who came up through my lab. Um, he's actually a neurosurgery resident at Stanford. Matt McDougall is now there at Neuralink. And I had a chat with him in anticipation of this. And we were just, um, there's no other word for it, really. We were just sort of re remarking at, at how fast brain-machine interface is moving and how much this is going to really merge with the core logic of, of what the human nervous system is designed to do, which is just as you said, which is to customize itself to experience. You know, a few years ago, I, I wouldn't have thought that the adult brain was as capable of plasticity as it is until, um, you know, there's a study that uh, Jay and Maureen Knights at the University of Washington have been doing, putting a, a new light sensor, a red, red cone, essentially, uh, photopigment, so this is like the equivalent of taking colorblind monkeys or people that can't see reds and putting in that option. So now they can see in that wavelength and the cortex knows what to do with it. They can do those animals learn color discrimination and they're now doing this. I think in people, they're now bringing those trials to people. So that tells me that that work plus what you're doing, neosensory and the, and what you describe in the book is that basically the cortex the neocortex and so much of the real estate in the human brain is designed to, to adapt. That's basically what the wiring is there for. And then of course, when you get into the, the regions below the cortex, we always think of it as, um, you know, I think the old, what will soon be the old narrative of lizard brains and stuff is actually, it turns out there's a lot more plasticity in the subcortical areas, the, the kind of deeper areas that we always thought were more hardwired. And I love that in your book, you cover the, the work of the Silver Spring monkeys and um ted jones and tim pons and it's so important so here's my question do you think that different areas of the brain differ in their amount of plasticity that they can incorporate like do the thought areas versus the ones that control i know a lot of people are interested in traumatic experience and learning and motor learning versus cognitive learning like do you think there's a hierarchy of plasticity, like some areas of the brain will never be changed after age, whatever, 30, and some areas you can change, or do you think it's all malleable using whatever technology? Yeah, so I, good. I, I actually addressed this question because I've long been wondering about this. It seems, for example, that the visual part of the brain kind of crunches into place pretty early on. And so if somebody goes blind a little bit later in life, they have less and less takeover. So if a, if a young child were to go blind because something happened to his eyes, touch and hearing and everything moves in very rapidly to take over that real estate. But, you know, as you get older and older, there's less takeover. So the visual system crunches down rapidly, but something like the somatosensory system and the motor system, those remain incredibly flexible essentially your whole life as far as we can tell. And, of course, you can learn how to, do a new thing like, you know, bicycle or surfboard or skate or rollerblade or hang glide or whatever it is, you can learn how to operate completely new machinery with your body um, at, at pretty much any age. And so what I ended up suggesting in the book is that this has to do with the stability of the data that comes in, by which I mean the visual system, you know, there's a certain number of colors in the world and there's a, that your eyes can pick up on and there's a certain number of angles and shapes and essentially that's it. It's a very stable data stream that comes in. So that's able to find a way to crunch down. Your somatosensory and motor systems, however, you know, you grow from an infant to an adult, you gain weight, you lose weight, you get stronger, you get weaker, you jump on a pogo stick, a bicycle, these kinds of things. So that constantly stays flexible because of the variability um, of the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... Um... That's really interesting because I think uh, I think it was our other colleague, uh, Bob Sapolsky, um, the great Bob Sapolsky, who uh, I heard him at a was actually at a colleague's retirement party. And he said something like, um, you know, neuroplasticity is sort of neuroscience's great promise to the world of trauma and self-healing. And, you know, and it raises this question, like, are all areas of the brain designed to change in the ways that we want them to or some more rigid and fixed. My, my take on this, and tell me if you uh, feel free to disagree, that's what we do in our business anyway. Um, my take on this is that for certain brain areas, like the fear centers and the areas that are really designed to keep us safe in response to, you know, hot surfaces and things like that, that it's going to be harder to unwire and that we're going to have to and change connection. We're going to have to rely more on brain machine interface. Whereas for other things we could probably rely just on behavioral tools and and then that raises a kind of third category and it's not one that i talk about too much on here because it's still 
mostly in the experimental and um, clinically uh, uncertain area, but I get asked all the time about psychedelics. And one of the things that people always ask is, you know, will a substance increase plasticity? Does it give plasticity? And what, I, what I've been trying to get across to people, and I'd love your thoughts on this, is, you know, plasticity itself is not the end point, right? There's a certain, plasticity is a process. And the, but how specific does a, does a sort of intention or goal of plasticity need to be in order for the circuitry to follow it? For instance, I don't think I could ever rewire myself to, to be a completely different person but I could probably rewire my brain to learn a, a second language, which I still haven't managed to do. Um, so, you know, obviously I'm asking you to draw artificial distinctions where these are along a continuum, but just what are your thoughts about behavioral changes for plasticity drugs? Obviously we're not suggesting anyone go do those, but you know, in the legal context or in the clinical context, chemicals and then brain machine interface. And do you think those will ever be combined to be more effective? Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. So let me go in backwards order. Yeah, um, as, as <laughs> let me see if I can even hold on to all the parts of the question there. As far as the, what allows something to change, one of the big, and you know this from reading the book, Andrew, but, um, and from your other research, but the, um, one of the things that's absolutely critical for change to happen is motivation or relevance to one's life. So, you know, learning another language you know, to the degree that it can be relevant for someone's life and they get the reward for it. And, um, uh, you know, just, I, I mean, I, I hope this isn't a, a crude thing to say in any way, but my, my father, uh, when he was in medical uh, residency rotations in Europe, uh, did his clinical rotations in every different country. And he speaks eight languages fluently. And the reason is because he, he was a young single man and he ended up getting girlfriends in every country. And so he had a motivation to learn the language. He was actually in relationships. And so he, that's what allowed him to speak fluently. Um, whereas if you're sitting in a class and getting beaten to try to learn how to speak Mongolian or something, it might not stick as well. So that's one of the themes of the book is about the necessity for that. In fact, uh, one of the things I use as an example is what if Venus and Serena Williams had a hypothetical brother named Fred Williams who didn't like tennis and he went through the same number of hours of practice, but he wasn't getting the reward from it. The reward circuitry is absolutely critical to making the plasticity stick and burn things down into the circuitry. He, he wouldn't, uh, you know, improve his skills very much. And there's plenty of research to, to demonstrate that. Um, the thing about brain machine interfaces, um, you know, I think it's there, there, let me just say one thing, which is there are two very different approaches to it. So, for example, what I'm doing with Neosensory and what Musk is doing at Neuralink. And the difference is just non-invasive versus invasive. And I actually think that matters a lot because, um, you know, this you can buy for a few hundred bucks and feed in any data stream. What Musk is doing, he's really pushing things forward in a, in a wonderful way. Um, he's getting a higher density of electrode reading and presumably writing at some point. Um, but you have to get an open head surgery. And uh, the, what seems clear enough is that Neuralink will be really useful for, um, you know, different kind of clinical cases where you want to get a bunch of electrodes into an area. But, of course, the mythology around Neuralink is that, oh, everyone's going to want to do, well, I'll just go get a, one of these implants. But the fact is that neurosurgeons aren't going to want to do this because there's always risk of infection and death on the operating table. And it's not clear that I, as a consumer, you know, I really want to interface with my phone faster than with my thumbs, but I'm not necessarily going to go get an open head surgery for that. So I think that's, uh, you know, it's a very different kind of ball game. And there was one question you asked in the middle. Oh, I, yeah. The, the other question. No, you, and sorry for throwing out three, but I, I, I figure, you know, I'll, I'll, why not? Um, why not? The, the other question was, you know, I hear very little, um, unfortunately, about com combining behavior Neuro, neuromodulator augmentation, aka sequence drugs, and um, brain machine interface. You know, for instance, we know there are certain learning regimes like chunking, generate, and tapping into the reward system that one can do purely behaviorally. You can tell yourself to, you're doing a good job, you're on the right track, sort of be, behave. But then, of course, there are all other ways to increase neuromodulators that impact. And, oh, oh, yeah, the so drugs. Why people haven't? Yeah. Why you think just in reflecting on the the field, um, why those haven't been 
um, combined. And one could also imagine, for instance, like, is, do you imagine a day in which neurosensory and the plasticity that it's designed to invoke will be accelerated by people taking, say, a cholinergic agent or something right before a learning episode? I'll tell you. So in LiveWired, I deal with this very interesting question that I hadn't thought about some years ago. And I don't think this has been a, some people have talked about, but this question of, would you actually want more plasticity? So here's what I mean by that. As we age, plasticity diminishes. In part, that is beca- it's not simply, oh, you're getting older and your brain's getting worse. In part, it's because the job of the brain, of course, as you know, is to make an internal model of the world, to figure out how to operate in the world. The brain is locked in silence and darkness inside the vault of the skull. And it's trying to figure out how to operate the limbs and what to do to get what it needs. Okay. As you get a better and better model of the world, it becomes less easy to to change this around precisely because you sort of got it. Like, you know what to do, how people react, what you're supposed to behave like in a meeting, how to write a paper, whatever. Um, And so people as they age often have this lamentation where they think, oh, wouldn't it be great to have the plasticity of a child again? But you would actually lose everything that you have. You would lose your skills at understanding the world. You would lose the language that you speak. You would lose your memories. All of these things would be lost. So although it's nice to fantasize on the spectrum about going back here, I actually think that would be a a nightmare scenario if we, let's say, discovered a drug that just opened you up and made you totally plastic again, unless you had some sort of guide to walk you through it to make sure that you're at least reshaping yourself the way you think you want to reshape yourself. Um, yeah, you would essentially lose you and become somebody else. The super interesting, uh, yeah, stability is sort of like we, we concentrate so much on improving memory and people love, you see in the popular press stories about, and about scientific studies of memory, but um, forgetting is just as important as remembering. If you want to build a stable representation, you don't want to remember everything. And I think sometimes that's overlooked. I think- yeah, by the way, there, just real quick, there was an Indian philosopher who said, memory is beautify life but only forgetting makes it bearable. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Cool. Anyway, keep going, sorry. Grab that quote, that was beautiful. Um, and it captures so much of what the, the, the research um, tell us. So I often get asked this question and I try and come up with an answer that I think is reasonable and grounded in the literature, which is why is it really that the young brain is so much more plastic than the adult? Hmm. So, you know, I can think of a couple reasons in humans, right, where for instance, uh, the adult brain, a lot of the extracellular space is filled up with matrix and glia and things that kind of cement things in place. The neurons don't want to move around as much and they can't. Um, but in terms of neurochemistry, you know, I'm not aware that there's that the young baby brain is like swimming around in acetylcholine and dopamine and serotonin. The adult brain is and it just seems that the circuits are more restricted in adulthood. And unfortunately, well, Torrenston Weasel still alive. David unfortunately passed away. But Mike Merzenich is still alive and I'm, I'm still searching for an answer on this. And it seems like there's no one smoking gun that says, oh, this is the reason plasticity shuts off. Would you agree? Well, there is one thing worth noting, which is that, um, so one of the most important systems in the brain is with acetylcholine, this neurotransmitter that goes broadly broadcast all over the place. And so in babies, when something new happens and something interesting to attend to whenever you get acetylcholine all over the place. And what happens is that in adults, because of changes in the circuitry and the other things happening around this, even though you still have the wiring to release acetylcholine everywhere, it gets released only in the little spots where you want the change to happen. So the way I think about this is in a baby, it's like a Polaroid picture where the whole thing is coming into focus at once. But in adults, you know, you just, it's like a point to list uh, painting where you're just hitting a few spots here and there. So that's one of the physical changes that we're able to measure and see that change. But, but as I said, one of the, I, I think the key thing to keep in mind is that it may be that the diminishing plasticity is precisely because you're doing things right and you're getting a better and better model and therefore cementing things into place and trying to hold on to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the great successes, of course, of neuroplasticity is ocular dominance plasticity, the closure of one eye and that the brain loses representations of the visual fields taken over by auditory and tactile information, as you mentioned earlier. I think one of the great challenges that research neuroscience has had in bringing neuroplasticity to the general public more broadly and that your book really does so beautifully is the fact that this 
the eye system, the ocular dominant system, as it's called, is wonderful. But there were a whole set of studies that showed, you know, increase serotonin with Prozac, you get plasticity back in adulthood. Increase acetylcholine, you get plasticity, uh, you know, back. And uh, our colleague, Mike Stryker at UCSF, called these fountain of youth experiments. But they never, and, and they, there were so many of these that eventually it seemed like anything you could put into the adult brain would reopen ocular dominance plasticity in an experimental animal. But now, 2020, we're faced with this reality that it's really a small just set of systems, as you mentioned, acetylcholine probably being the most um, powerful one, and perhaps a few other neurochemical systems. Do any come to mind for you besides acetylcholine? I, I generally think of acetylcholine and dopamine as the gates to plasticity, reward and focus being the two critical elements. That's exactly right. Yeah, if something is really rewarding and specifically unexpectedly rewarding, whoa, that really worked, then, then you get changes happening. Because essentially, uh, of course, what the brain is trying to do is say, I'm going to build an internal model of the world and, and hardwire things deeper and deeper into my circuitry so that I don't get surprised, so that I can run rapidly and efficiently without having to include all this conscious thinking about things. For example, you know, um, when you start playing a new sport and at first you're like, oh my God, what's going on and where's the ball and what am I supposed to do? But a pro at the sport just runs around and does everything. And of course, one of the surprises is that the professional's brain is burning much less activity, even though he or she is doing this incredible job, they're burning hardly any, acti uh, any energy because it's all down in the hardwiring now. And, uh, and of course, this is, you, know, you probably know the study with, uh, with Tetris, you know, amateurs versus pros at Tetris. The pros are running so fast and efficient, but burning hardly any energy at it. So this is the job of the brain is to, um, you know, is to get that in place. And uh, wait, just remind me, what was the, oh, oh yeah, yeah, dopamine. So, so the key is, um, what it's trying to do is predict the world, and it, it only changes when there's surprise. So that surprise might be, whoa, that was rewarding or punishing, um, or, wow, that's something that didn't fit in my model at all. I better pay attention to it to figure out what it was. And then, so you're just making changes to, to improve the model that you already have. Great. Just a couple more questions. You know, we talked about the difference between neurosensory, where you're manipulating the sensory information. There's a transformation of it versus what um, Neuralink is doing, which is uh, they're, one of their stated goals is to go beneath the skull and, and get into the, the central nervous system, probably first for therapeutic purposes and then maybe in a general population way eventually. Um, there's an intermediate space, which, of course, is the peripheral nervous system. So, for instance, I, I'm not so sure I want a hole drilled in my skull unless I absolutely need one. Um, but I would probably personally be willing to, say, put a stimulator on my vagus nerve or my phrenic nerve if I thought it would make me better in some way. Because the periphery and the peripheral nervous system, it just, it's, you know, you can pop things in and out. <laughs> um, you still yeah. have a condition to put it in there. And my understanding from one of the, from the neurosurgeon at Neuralink, just because I know him well, is he actually has a little radio receiver implanted in his hand to, that opens his car door. This was done long before he joined Neuralink or Neuralink existed. So I think of like the, the periphery is maybe that kind of gray zone where maybe even David Eagleman is going to be, uh, has a device implanted under his clavicle or something, as opposed to wearing something on a wrist. You think it's eventually going there before sub, you know, uh, subdural, sub, uh, you know, drilling into the skull. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's actually why I put my chips on making peripheral devices. I mean, this is one that you just take on and off, but you can, um, you know, pass information streams into the brain this way without needing to get open head surgery. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Things are really exciting. Well, I, I know that you're super busy. You're on this massive book tour. So I know we, we, we booked about 30 minutes. Or so um, I have one more question and then I, I, I think we'll probably just refer people to the book if you if they have more plasticity. Well, actually, I've seen a whole bunch of questions coming across here almost faster than I can keep up with. But uh, I can I can stick around for a few minutes. This is really fun and right. answer some things. Even better so, questions list. So for people that have questions, it, it, it sends it to a queue for me. Um, I'm going to just um, I'm going to go with the ones that I'm seeing multiple times, even if they're coming from the same person. Um, we already talked about Neuralink. Um, I got three different questions about nicotine and neuroplasticity. Um, and so uh, 
maybe we'll just talk about nicotine as a receptor for acetylcholine. Thoughts on that? Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting because, as you know, people have the, – the neuroscience community for years has been looking for nootropic drugs, by which they mean, you know, a drug that enhances your, uh, your memory or your ability for having plasticity. And despite the excitement every few years, there, there's not that much good stuff. But we do have things like nicotine and caffeine and so on, other chemicals that do seem to focus attention and keep things um, – yeah, uh, help with plasticity in a very minor way, but, but it certainly helps, yeah. Yeah, and unfortunately, the, the major route of nicotine delivery is cigarettes, which has other issues, but... Exactly right, exactly right. You don't, you don't want that path if you don't have to. Right. I see a lot of questions about microdosing of various chemicals. I think we talked about that in the, in the psychedel, you know, in our earlier discussion. I mean, I think, as David put so beautifully, you know, the plasticity itself is not the goal. You need a directed plasticity. I mean, I think the nervous system, yeah. you're not trying to just make your brain change generally. And I think, unfortunately, the word plasticity has come to mean, well, fortunately, something positive, but without an, a specific end goal of learning eight languages for purposes of better enhanced relationships or, um, or converting sound waves into, into light so that somebody who's blind can essentially see with their ears the incredible work that you're doing at Neurosensory, among other things. I think that um, plasticity isn't the goal per se, but just since we're on this topic, and it does seem to be something that people are very interested in. What are your thoughts about the clinical trials and the, there's so much discussion around uh, the clinical trials at Hopkins and elsewhere, psilocybin and, and MDMA? Well, what are your thoughts, if any, about those? Yeah, I, I mean... I tell you, so I have just I happen to be the not done any though in that sense. I'm very inexpert on it, but um, when I talk to I you know so many friends here in the Bay Area who do you know, who are deep psychonauts and they do all kinds of things, um, they talk about it as opening up different cosmic channels and so on and being able to see it. I sort of have my doubts about that in the sense that what you know we know the details of how these drugs are binding to the receptors and how that changes the firing of the neurons and how that changes the network properties. What these drugs seem to do is sort of just change the networks by 5% in terms of where the information is flowing. And what fascinates me is how much that can change one's conscious experience. In other words, you just knock the system off a little bit. And to me, that is such an interesting insight inroad into consciousness specifically how fragile it is. You just, you just change these receptor properties a little bit here or there, and suddenly your consciousness is talking to silver leprechauns or whatever. <laughs> so it's very fascinating to me, uh, that aspect of it. By the way, let me, just, let me just throw in one other thing about nicotine that I uh, just thought of right after we ended that question, which was, y y you guys may know this, but you know, most people, at least in America, mo almost nobody smokes, except for people with schizophrenia. All people with schizophrenia smoke, every one of them. And it's because they're actually self-medicating. It's by binding to the nicotine, nic nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, they're actually helping themselves get sort of back in the right zone. Um, yeah. So, I, one yeah. Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist at Columbia, I won't out him by name, who in an hour-long meeting, um, you can probably guess who this is because he made many jokes. He's very, very tall. And he, <laughs> and he chewed no fewer than five pieces of Nicaragua. In, wow. uh, in a short meeting. Now, Nicorette doesn't make, every, make some people feel lousy, so I'm not recommending this, but he is in his 70s and he's still quite sharp, but then again, he was always sharp. So who knows? Uh, <laughs> you know, David, um, uh, and feel free to pass on, on this question, but you know, a couple people are asking here, um, what do you do, you meaning you specifically, they've named you, yeah. um, not me, uh, to, um, to sort of lean better into plasticity paradigms when you want to learn? Do you have any um, tools? I don't like the word hacks because hacks sort of imply that you're using something for a purpose it wasn't intended and the brain was designed to work this way. So what are some things that you might do um, that you enjoy or that uh, you, you, you know, just want to pass? Yeah, I, I would say there are a couple of things. I mean, one thing, actually my last book, The Runaway Species was about, you know, essentially asking this question of what is creativity from the brain's point of view? And I'll tell you, in that, you know, the answer is what you're doing is taking in the diet of everything that you learn, and then you're remixing that. You're bending, breaking, blending all these things and generating new ideas. 
So lesson number one, of course, is just have a rich diet. In other words, take in lots of information. Just, I don't know, I would say try not to waste time by, you know, but instead always be learning something. And it doesn't mean sitting down and studying books necessarily, but always, you know, challenging your brain. And that really is the second point, I think, of what, uh, what I try to personally do is always find ways to, to seek novelty because this is the most important lesson that surfaced in neuroscience is um, you get changes happening in the brain when the brain is facing new challenges. And I'll just say very briefly that when people retire, you know, you have people whose lives shrink and then they really are in trouble in terms of dementias and other, you know, physical diseases that start ravaging their brain tissue as opposed to people who stay cognitively active till their final days. They're constantly dealing with other people and they have chores and responsibilities and learning new things. And these people, some of them have let's say Alzheimer's, their brain tissue is physically getting chewed up and yet they don't show the cognitive deficits that other people do because even as things are falling apart, they're building new bridges all the time. And that's where you want to be. You want to be building new bridges and, and making this sort of stuff happen. So what I try to do personally is just as an example, back five months ago when we used to drive, um, you know, I, I always drive a different route home from work. Um, and it takes a few extra minutes, but otherwise, you know how this goes. You become an automatized zombie, and you're always, you know, you're driving the same route home, and it feels like no time has even passed. So I try to drive a different route home. I try doing things all the time, like brushing my teeth with my other hand or shaving with my other hand. It's not that hard, uh, and you know, but it's it's representative of this thing that I'm trying to do always, which is seeking novel challenges where my brain has to work a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I love that you mentioned challenges because, uh, you know, I feel like the challenge um, goes with a sense of sometimes confusion, a little bit of agitation. And that I have to believe is a neurochemical signature in the form of probably epinephrine, adrenaline, you know, at a low level that cues the brain that something has changed and therefore yeah. to pay attention. And, you know, as agitation being the, it's kind of the first gate into attention. Uh, I really like that. In terms of um, the plasticity process, you know, uh, I always think of it as a, of course, it's a, not a two-stage process, but we can artificially break it up into the triggering plasticity and then the actual changes that occur in the wiring that occur seem to be away from the plasticity event, in particular during periods of deep sleep or periods of deep rest. Um, do you uh, enhance or focus on rest and rejuvenation as a way to enhance plasticity that you've created earlier in the day or earlier in the week or are you just no I, I i believe in it i believe in it strongly but i have i mean you know somehow with lockdown i've been working 18 hour days ever since this started and you know i just had my new book live wired come out last week and so i'm just constantly on the go now but yes i do believe i do think uh, I, I mean as we know you know sleep has been shown to be incredibly important and by the way naps also naps are as good as a night in terms of consolidating information and getting it locked in there. Yes. Yeah. So by, the, by the way, if I could take a one second tangent, one of my, one of my favorite um, new things in the book is this new theory that I have about why we dream at night. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if you got to that part in the book, but it's, um, I, I'll just do this in, in, a, in a few sentences, which is- Time as you like. Uh, great, which is, you know, Nothing in the brain lies fallow. Everything gets taken over if it's not being used. It's like, it's like real estate. You know, if, if a restaurant in San Francisco goes out of business, it's not just going to sit empty. Someone else is going to take over that real estate. So um, it turns out that when people go blind, the visual cortex gets taken over. And, and the, sh the, the, the surprising finding in neuroscience just, uh, you know, uh, about 13 years ago was how fast that happens. So if you take adults and you blindfold them tightly and you stick them in the scanner, within an hour, you start seeing activity in the occipital cortex, which is normally thought of as visual cortex, but you start seeing activity based on hearing and touch. So in other words, this encroachment starts to happen unbelievably rapidly. And so what my student and I realized is that given the rotation of the planet into darkness for half the hours, in evolutionary time, the brain needed a way to defend the visual cortex because you can still hear and touch in the dark and smell and taste, but you can't see in the dark. 
And so it turns out that, that we hypothesize that dreaming is simply a way of the, uh, the brain to defend this territory and only this territory. If you look at the circuitry, it's extremely specific. It just blasts activity into the occipital cortex every 90 minutes during the night. Um, and so what it's doing is it's defending itself against encroachment from the other senses. And because it's visual cortex, we see in our dreams. And by the way, blind people have dreams where they don't see, but they, you know, they feel like they're going, you know, they're, it's characterized by bizarreness, just like our dreams, but they're going around their living room. They're like, hey, why is the furniture moved? And, you know, there's a big hairy ape over here and whatever. But it's because they're getting activity blasted into their occipital cortex, but that's no longer visual now. It's about touch and hearing and so on. Uh, I love that explanation because, um, or idea of why we dream, A, because I'm a vision scientist by training, and, and, um, and I, like to de I like the idea that the visual system is actually working to defend itself, um, not just at scientific conferences. That was a, yeah. that was a science joke, folks. <laughs> so, but, by the way, just as a quick side note, if I, I saw some comments. That if anyone's interested in the paper, it's on BioArchive. It's called The Defensive Activation Theory, so you can read the paper if you want. And it's, in the, it's in the book also. Defensive Activation Theory? Defensive activation theory yep. on bioarchive. Terrific. Thank you yeah. for that. Yeah, you know, it's it's amazing to me how much visual circuitry is and eye movement circuitry is wired into the sleep process as well. You know, when you look at all these subcortical areas that are involved in vision and then the pawns and then the, the connection to visual cortex, like why would you have all this eye movement stuff happening in sleep, like rapid eye movements, slow drifting eye movements? I think your theory is. Um, uh, fits well with the idea that you want the whole system defending the relationship between not just visual imagery, but ocular motor behavior and this, this kind of thing as well. So love it. Very Maybe, very cool. I wonder who would be willing to paralyze their or, or quiet their visual cortex during dreams and see if they gave up some vision. I don't know. Uh, well, so, so I've been looking into that. So it turns out that people on particular antidepressants like tricyclics and monoamine oxidase inhibitors, um, have less dreaming. So now I'm looking into running a study on this about whether their vision gets worse. And by the way, this is one of the things that's noted is that people on these drugs get worse vision, um, but it's thought in the clinical community that's because of dry eyes. But I'm trying to figure out if that's true or not. Yeah. It'd be amazing if it was happening in the central nervous system and not at the yeah. level of eyes. Exactly. Fantastic. Right? Yeah. Um, so there are a couple more questions here. And if we just keep you for a couple more minutes, I know people are, sure. um, uh, people are, yeah. So I'm getting a lot of questions about focus, you know, and I get this a lot, um, you know, whether or not there are ways, whether or not the circuitry in the brain that gives rise to focus, things like acetylcholine, things like the epinephrine system, ascending brainstem circuitry and so forth, whether or not those circuits are amenable to plasticity, whether or not people can actually improve their ability to hold concentration, and if so, what, with, what, some, what that might look like in terms of building up that capacity. And that, yeah, that's a very important question. I don't know the answer to that. I, I just don't know. I mean, that's an area uh, for research into the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I think there are these techniques like the Pomodoro techniques of setting timers and you go 20 minutes and then you rest five minutes and things like that. What I usually offer as an answer and tell me if you agree or disagree is that, you know, just like it takes time to warm up for exercise, sometimes it takes time to warm up for focus that we're not, we can't really expect ourselves to drop into a deep focus like a step function that, you know, you have to perhaps warm up and limit distractions. Do you have a practice of limiting distraction? Do you put your phone in the other room when you need to write or when you, uh, spend time with people and you, you need to be fully present or are you good at navigating all that? Yeah, no. And, and in fact, this is just what, this is just what I was thinking is the, the only technique that I know that I use all the time is just, um, you know, what's called a Ulysses contract with your, where you're making a contract with your future self. Uh, if you guys remember in the, the Odyssey, um, Odysseus or Ulysses, uh, depending on Greek or Latin name, is going to pass the Island of the Sirens and he knows that they sing so beautifully that all mortal men crash into the rocks and die. So he has his men lash him to the mast and he has his sailors fill their ears with beeswax and he instructs them, just keep going, but I'm going to listen to the siren song, but I'm going to be lashed to the mast so that I can't do anything about it. And that's how he gets to hear it. What this is, is the Ulysses of sound mind making a contract with his future self because he knows his future self will act badly. So he ties him down, right? 
So this is the way that I always work on increasing focus is um, by making sure that I set things up appropriately um, so that I can do it. Just as one example, by the way, I, I gave a talk on this some years ago on a college campus, and these kids came up to me afterwards and told me that during finals week, they switch Facebook passwords with each other and change the passwords so that they each can't get into Facebook. And then at the end of finals, when it's done, then they give the passwords back. But this is an example of a really good idea of a Ulysses contract where you say, look, I know I'm going to get distracted by this, so I'm setting things up in advance where it won't happen. And by the way, this is one of the first rules that, uh, for example, Alcoholics Anonymous, they say clear all the alcohol out of your house because as, as much as you think you're dedicated to not doing it, there's going to be some lonely Saturday night or some festive Friday night or whatever where you're going to break into that. And with drug addiction rehab programs, they say don't walk around with more than $20 in your pocket because – at some point, you're going to run into someone who's trying to sell you drugs, and you're going to go ahead and do it. Um, so just make sure that you're setting up the circumstances so that you can't behave badly. All right. That's great because it um, validates a, a practice I used to do with my lab. If I need to finish a grant or paper, I would hand them my phone during the day, and I would promise everybody $500. My lab was quite large back then. Um, and at the, if I asked for my phone back, and a couple times, it actually was difficult to not ask for it back. I started negotiating the cost of this. Amazing. <laughs> So that leads me to perhaps, I, you know, I think one of the questions I've seen come through, and I've been wondering about this, you know, we talk about bring machine interface, like it's going to be a device we strap on, like you guys are making or put under the skull. But we may already be in a brain machine interface regime with the phone. You know, I, you know, for the people who know a little bit about neuroscience, Broadman defined all these different areas, numbered them Broadman areas from one up to I think goes up to the high 40s or 50s. I can't remember how far. It's I don't remember the top number yet. I sometimes think as my phone is containing Broadman areas, you know, 60 through 75, because there's information there that is very much customized to me, but organized in a way that my cerebral cortex can't manage. And so I rely on the phone more and more for those kind of, um, uh, to steal the language of neuroscience, those kind of lateral connections. It, it's a storage bank. It has maps. It has um, transformative devices from, you know, to text. So I'm, I sometimes think of the phone, the smartphone as a brain machine interface device. It's just that I carry it. I don't strap it onto my wrist or put it under my skull. Oh, oh, exactly right. It's, it's our exo brain. And before that, that's what written language is. And that actually accounts for so much of the success of our species is having an ability to say, okay, we're going to write this down in a book and then you can access it later and I can come back to my thing and see the instructions for how to do something. So, yes, this, uh, all these methods that we have that, you know, my lovely dog does not have for saying I'm going to not just rely on this uh, machinery here but have uh, some form of exo brain on the outside. Great. Well, you, you, the fact you mentioned recording is perfect. This has been recorded. It will upload um, to my Instagram site. Unfortunately, I don't think there's a way to easily share it between sites, but please everyone um, make sure that you go and, cause he's not gonna say it, I'm going to go follow David's Instagram. He's got an Instagram and he's also on other social media platforms. His book is Live Wired and it's all about this topic of plasticity with incredible examples. If you're somebody who's interested in shaping their nervous system and how that's done for the better, how he talks about disease states, deprived states, but also enhancing sensory and cognitive and motor function. It's an amazing read. And I don't just say that because he's my colleague at Stanford and because I like him and he's a nice guy. I say that because for the last couple of years, as I've been doing a little bit more public facing science education, people always ask me, what's a great book on neuroplasticity? And there are some really great ones out there like Spark and others, but they're, you know, they're, that's been a few years and then a lot has happened in the last 10, 15 years. And so now finally, I can refer them to this incredible collection of text, And the images are really beautiful too. Thank I, you. It has beautiful photographs and images. So if you're an audiobook person, listen to the audiobook. But if you like books as I do, handheld books as well, consider that because I'm sure there's other ways to access the images with the audiobook. But the book itself is a beautiful one. And um, it's out now. I'm sure you're going to be on the, the, the worldwide tour. But thanks for taking time to talk with us about plasticity and uh, I know we love this topic, and hopefully we'll catch up soon in, uh, in Menlo Park or Palo Alto. Terrific. Thanks, Andrew. Such a pleasure to be here. Yeah, likewise. Talk soon. All dude. right. Talk yeah. soon. Cheers.